everybody, welcome to the Mandalik. I'm John as always, and it's that time again. It's the War of the Spark set review. The white set review is what we're going to be looking at today. Before we get started, let's talk about the set review just a little bit. Keep in mind, this is a limited set review. We're talking primarily about draft, but everything we talk about is still basically applicable to sealed. Just you won't be picking your cards, you'll have them in your pool and decide on whether or not you want to play them. Keep in mind as well that I have not played this set yet, and so I could be right or wrong about some of these things. Ratings absolutely change as the format goes on, and of course that's why we have the top 10 cards I was wrong about at the end of the set. This is just how I'm going to approach these cards when I do get around to playing this, uh, which is going to be Tuesday, April 23rd, over at twitch.tv slash League, where you can catch me playing War of the Spark two days before anybody else except for the other four or 500 streamers also in this event Wizards has invited me to and given me a full account and access to. And then, of course, remember that I make no claims to be the absolute best Magic player ever, so... These are my ratings. I want you to give me your ratings. I want you to talk in the comments with me and with each other about what I, what you think I'm right about, what you think I'm wrong about. And of course, any of us could be right or wrong. One other reminder that I haven't given before, but I will now. Don't get too hung up on the grades. The grades are there just for you to have kind of like a, oh, okay, that's what John thinks of the card. It's not meant to be a massively scientific this is a C plus and therefore this card, which is slightly better, must be a B minus. The grades are a little bit fluid. In fact, people were so hung up on the grades last time around that I strongly considered replacing all grades with unique sound effects just to get rid of the people complaining. So don't get too hung up on the grades. The entire point of this is the discussion of the cards. I do know that a lot of people coming from Hearthstone and games like that really want tier lists, but tier lists don't exist in magic. They're useless. What's important is evaluating these cards, discussing these cards, and the multitude of scenarios where you might pick them and play them. But with that out of the way, let's get on to the set review. We're going to start on white today. We're going to skip the colorless cards. We're going to pile them in with the artifacts after green or after gold, but we're going to start off today with a Johnny's Pride Mate, a card we know because it was in M19 very recently and many sets before that as well. A Johnny's Pride Mate is one and a white for a creature cat soldier at Oncom and it's a 2-2. Whenever you gain life, put a plus one plus one counter on a Johnny's Pride Mate. A Johnny's Pride Mate in M19 was a great card because black white was the life gain deck. There were so many ways to gain life. This time around, there's not actually that many. There's a few cards in white that have lifelink or perhaps gain you life, but they're not necessarily good or playable as we'll see very shortly. So this isn't exactly the huge builder ground great card that it was in M19. You have to take this a little bit more as a bear. And if you happen to have uh, a lifelinker or something, maybe you can make this grow a little bit, but I don't think you're gonna be loading this with counters the way that you were in M19. So I think this is like a C plus. It's a bear with an upside. So it's a card that you're fine playing and you'll probably play it more often than not, but you're not going out of your way to get this card and it's not going to be uh, uh, absolutely insane. Basically, every Planeswalker has a uh, uh, Planeswalker name apostrophe S something and this is a Johnny's and they couldn't think of a better a Johnny's card, I suppose. So a Johnny's Pride Mate C plus in this format, despite it being better in previous formats. Up next is Battlefield Promotion. Battlefield Promotion is one and a white for an instant at common. Put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. That creature gains first strike until end of turn. You gain two life. I'm not super happy with cards that just give a counter. Two life doesn't make me that much happier, but first strike for the turn. I think that sells me. It's Storm Strike that sticks around, minus the scry, of course, because of the counter. So I think this is actually solid, and I think this fits into my C plus combat trick pile. Uh, that's kind of the max that I usually give to combat tricks, and those are the combat tricks that I'm pretty happy to play the first copy of. Um, so I'll probably play this whenever I can in a white deck. I don't know if I'll play more than them, but the first one, yeah, it's a C plus. C plus for Battlefield Promotion. Up next is Bond of Discipline. Bond of Discipline is four and a white for a sorcery at Uncommon. Tap all creatures your opponents control. Creatures you control gain lifelink until end of turn. I think this reads better than it actually is. This is not sleep. You have to win this turn or else you're just not doing very much. You don't get the extra turn like sleep did. Yes, you're gaining life, which makes you more stable, but if you weren't freely attacking them already, you're not gonna be freely attacking them next turn. 
basically this is a falter effect except not falter is there a name for falter falter of course is non flyers can't block this is everything can't block um, but yeah this is an effect that you should probably only ever be casting if it is ending the game I'll die to this but I don't think I'll ever really want to play this unless I'm in an aggro deck where my opponent will already be pretty low life except this is really expensive for an aggro deck. An aggro deck would prefer this at four mana or three mana, if possible. Five mana is a bit of a tall ask. So I'm gonna start a little bit pessimistic on this in the D plus range. I don't think it's very good and I'm not really looking forward to playing it. Up next is Bulwark Giant. Bulwark Giant is five and a white for a creature giant soldier at common. It's a three six. When Bulwark Giant enters the battlefield, you gain five life. So you. You see what I was saying about a Johnny's Pride Mate not really having good support. This is an example. This isn't a very good card. It's six mana for a three six, which is just not something that I'm ever wanting to play. And five life is not going to convince me otherwise. Just zero interest in this other than the, uh, you know, the oh no, I don't have 23 cards yet pile of creatures. It's a D plus. I'm going to actively avoid playing this as much as possible. So I promise this is a really good, powerful set but not yet. Charmed Stray is up next. Charmed Stray is a single white mana for a creature cat at common. It's a 1-1 one, one with lifelink. When Charmed Stray enters the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on each other creature you control named Charmed Stray. Just, I, I'm super not interested in this. The first one's unplayable. A 1-1 one, one lifelinker for one is not a card you should ever, 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 ever play. It's bad. The second one is okay? Like, you have a 2-2 two -two lifelink for two mana you've put into it, plus a 1-1 one -one lifelink, which, as we talked about, is worthless. But you have to draw them and play them both, and the first one has to not die. Super, super disinterested in this. A hard F. Absolutely no interest. I will never play it. It is a bad, bad, bad card. Remember, you might be thinking, oh, but if I get seven of them, remember in the average draft, there's between two and three copies of any given common you're not getting seven of these. Um, and even then, I still wouldn't advise playing it. A hard F on Charmed Stray. It is not good. Defiant Strike is next. Defiant Strike is a single white mana for an instant at common. Target creature gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn, and you draw a card. So this is a reprint that we've seen from Cons of Tarkir originally, and it's not great. It's not terribly inf impactful. Plus one, plus zero is about the least impactful that a combat trick can be. I guess maybe plus one, plus zero would be worse. Replacing itself doesn't really make me want to play this in the first place. I don't play cards just because they can cycle, which I know a lot of people do. You know, oh, this card, well, at the worst, it draws a new card. Yeah, but you could play a card that does something else. You could play a card that does something good. Play good cards. This isn't the old days of draft. You shouldn't really be scrounging for playables. It's not like you have to decide to put this in because you didn't have anything else, so at least it draw, uh, draws a new card. Not a big fan of this. Plus one, plus zero just is not impactful enough. I've got it at a D plus. It's not... In fact, D plus is even strong. I I'm putting this at a D. It's just not good. It it's very unimpactful. You can play better cards. Up next is Divine Arrow. Divine Arrow is one and a white for an instant at common. Divine Arrow deals four damage to target attacking or blocking creature. It's Gideon's Reproach with a new name, because as we'll see in some other cards, Gideon might not be having named cards anymore. This card's fine. It deals with a good bit of the set. Might not kill the absolute most scariest things, but you'll play multiples of these and be very happy. It's a solid B. It's maybe in the first pick consideration in some very bad packs, and it's a card that you'll pick up relatively highly and play multiples of, so a straight-up B for Divine Arrow. Up next is Enforcer Griffin. Enforcer Griffin is four and a white for a creature Griffin at common. It's a 3-4 with flying. And that's it. It's a, it's a vanilla 3-4 flyer for five. That's okay. It's relatively filler. Five mana 3-4s. We've seen them before. I believe there was a Lamasau or something. Uh, Shining Aerosaur uh, from Ixalan was a, a more recent version of this. It's okay. It's filler. You're not going to play it if you have better creatures, and if you don't, you play this, and it'll be okay. It's a C. It's kind of the definition of a C now. It's a card that you don't hate playing, but you'll avoid it when you can. So C for Enforcer Griffin. Up next is Finale of Glory. Finale of Glory is X white white for a sorcery at Mythic. Create X 2-2 two two white soldier creature tokens with vigilance. If X is 10 or more, narrator voice it won't be, also create X 4-4 four four white angel creature tokens with flying and vigilance. 
People often wonder why I say, oh, you don't always get to seven mana or eight mana. I think everybody can agree that you're not getting to 12 mana in a game of limited. You're just not. And this is a cycle. There's a finale for every color. So I'll repeat that, I guess, every single day this week. Yes, you random person listening to the set review, you might be the lucky person who does this once, but the rest of us, we're never doing it ever. So this is a three mana, two, two vigilance. That's not playable. That's not good enough. A four mana, four, four vigilance across two bodies. That's 100% playable. In fact, we knew that as Gallant Cavalry. We knew that as Call the Cavalry in recent sets. And in fact, it's a very good card. Any more mana pumped into this and it just becomes super good. I like this card a very good bit, uh, even if you're never actually casting it for 12 mana and winning the game, I hope. Uh, But I think this is a decent first pick unless there's a really premium removal in that pack. There's probably not going to be anything bombier than this, just because this is the rare. So I think this is a solid B. Very, very, very good card, and uh, I I guess it's good to see Gallant Cavalry yet again. And sometimes, even better than that. Up next is our first Planeswalker, and it's a doozy. If you somehow didn't hear about this, every single pack of War of the Spark has at least one Planeswalker in it, which I believe means there is one Planeswalker, there might be two if you have a foil. I don't think you're getting an uncommon and a rare Planeswalker in a pack without foils being involved. I would love if somebody could source the actual answer on that. I've heard both, but I'm pretty sure it's at least one, meaning you might get a foil. Anyways, there's a lot of Planeswalkers in this set, and they're uncommon, rare, and mythic, and we're going to start out with a mythic one. We have Gideon Blackblade. Gideon Blackblade is one white white for a legendary planeswalker Gideon at Mythic. He starts with four loyalty counters and he has two static abilities. Every single planeswalker in the set has at least one static ability. Gideon's static abilities are, as long as it's your turn, Gideon Blackblade is a 4-4 human soldier creature with indestructible that's still a planeswalker. In addition, prevent all damage that would be dealt to Gideon Blackblade during your turn. This is kind of the standard Gideon effect, except it's always on on your turn. Gideon additionally has a plus one ability of up to one other target creature you control gains your choice of Vigilance, Lifelink, or Indestructible until end of turn, and a minus six of Exile Target Non-Land Permanent. So an Indestructible 4-4 for three is extremely good, if not flat out bomby. The lack of evasion probably stops it from being like an instant game ending bomb. The plus one is really nice and a useful ability with the versatility uh, really helping vigilance if you need blockers on the, uh, you know, when you're past the turn, lifelink if you need to stabilize, indestructible if you just need to send in beef without fear. And the minus six is great. It's not active for several turns is kind of the one rough spot, but hopefully you've been stabilizing with your creatures. And if you have, then Gideon can minus six and continue to clear the way. All in all, Gideon just seems super good. I think it's a solid A tier Planeswalker. Uh, He's going to be really hard to deal with and get you value basically guaranteed. Doesn't quite instantly end the game, so I'm not going to go to A+, but I do think Gideon is a flat out A. First pick Gideon every single time you see him. Up next is Gideon Sacrifice. Every single Planeswalker has a, uh, a card named after them, like a Johnny's Pride Mate. Gideon Sacrifice is a single white mana for an instant at common. Choose a creature or Planeswalker you control. All damage that would be dealt to you and permanent you control this turn is dealt to the chosen permanent instead. It's a one-sided fog except the thing that super bites it. I'm not a huge fan. Remember, this card is amazing when it saves you and lets you turn around and win, but it does nothing outside of that perfect situation. It is a one-sided fog, meaning that your creatures still deal damage and your opponents don't, assuming you're casting this during a big combat step. But this just isn't a card that I'm looking to play. It's not as bad as fog, but the difference isn't really that major. Uh, One-sided fogs, I'm not usually that big on either. So I'm not super sold on this. I've got it at a D minus. I'm going to lose to it, but I don't think it's really all that good. So D minus for Gideon's Sacrifice. Up next is Gideon's Triumph. Each of the uh, the Gatewatch Planeswalkers have a Triumph card. Gideon's Triumph is one and a white for an instant at uncommon. Target opponent sacrifices a creature that attacked or blocked this turn. If you control a Gideon Planeswalker, that player sacrifices two of those creatures instead. We just talked about Gideon. He's a mythic. You're not having a Gideon. 
you're, you're, you're not. It's very rare. You might have a Gideon once or twice throughout the entire time that you draft this format, which is a shockingly short amount of time. Modern Horizons is only a month away, and Core Set is only two months away. But this is still one in a white kill an attacker or a blocker, and that's pretty darn good. It's an edict effect, so if you're being attacked by multiple creatures, you are only killing the worst one, but still totally fine. I think it's an easy B-. minus. If you can take the damage, you can also just cast this after combat is over, and you killed the other creatures to make sure that the, uh, the one you want is dead, because, uh, of course, a creature attacked even if it's the end step, and they did attack that turn. So B- minus for Gideon's Triumph. Up next is God Eternal Oketra. God Eternal Oketra is three white white for a legendary creature zombie god at Mythic. She's a 3-6 with double strike. Whenever you cast a creature spell, create a 4-4 black zombie warrior creature token with vigilance. When God Eternal Oketra dies or is put into exile from the battlefield, you may put it into the owner's library third from the top. So yay, one of my least favorite creature types is back the gods the incredibly powerful incredibly hard to deal with gods and oketra is uh real good this is going to be basically the end of the game if she comes down five mana three six is not the best but double strike so problem solved then for the low low cost of continuing to cast creatures you flood the board with four fours with vigilance and then if she dies She's just back in three turns. Now, I do actually like that ability. I think three turns is a big enough window that you can actually kill one of these gods and win. Um, but if you don't, it's coming back and it's going to be terrifying. Um, so yeah, Oketra is a slam dunk. She's an A+. There, there's really no discussion here. This card is absolutely insane. If you can cast, if you can cast a creature after playing Oketra, you're probably in a massive spot. And if you can cast more, I don't see how you're losing. A plus for Oketra. Always, always, always the best card in the pack. Up next is Grateful Apparition. Grateful Apparition is one and a white for a creature spirited on common. It's a 1-1 flyer. Whenever Grateful Apparition deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, proliferate. Proliferate is a mechanic that was first seen in New Phyrexia, and it's back for this format. Proliferate basically says that uh, when you proliferate, it could be on a damage trigger or maybe a spell just says, hey, proliferate. You get to choose any number of permanents that you want. Could be permanent you control, could, could be permanent your opponent's control. And what you do is for every type of counter on that permanent, you add another one. So you pick a planeswalker, you add another loyalty counter. You pick a creature that has a plus one plus one counter on it, you add another plus one plus one counter on it. You pick somebody who has an infect token on themselves, you give them another infect token, obviously. That's not in the format. So obviously with Planeswalkers, we are going to be proliferating loyalty counters quite a bit, but as we'll see in uh, future set reviews coming this week, there's a lot of plus one plus one counters kicking around as well. Now I have played with proliferate here and there in constructed decks and cubes, but I never actually played New Phyrexia, so I'm not quite familiar with exactly how good proliferate is other than I know it's good. Now this is a card that was in New Phyrexia. It was blue and called Thrumming Bird. It, the only thing that's happened here is it's become white instead. So will this be good? I, I, I don't know. The real counters deck appears to be the blue green deck. So I'm just not sure how you're going to be taking advantage of proliferate by playing this white card. But repeatable proliferate is huge. Proliferating once could be very good, but if you can do it turn after turn, you're going to just massively outvalue. But of course, you're only doing that if you do have counters on things. So this basically depends exclusively on how many cards with counters you have. This will range from an F, like unplayable, you should not put this into your deck, possibly upwards of a B, depending entirely on how many cards you have with counters, how many planeswalkers you have, how many plus one, plus one counters, etc. So I, I'm going to begin this leaning a little bit more towards the F, just because I do think that blue green is where the counters are heavily going to be. And then blue, black, red to a lesser extent, but still a big extent is where the counters are going to be. White just doesn't have as much. So I, I'm not saying this is an F. Sometimes it will be, but I'm leaning more towards the F than I am towards the B. Up next is Ignite the Beacon. Ignite the Beacon is four and a white for an instant at rare. Search your library for up to two Planeswalker cards, reveal them, put them into your hand, then shuffle your library. Uh, no interest in this, no real interest at all. Instant speed maybe saves this from being an F, 
It obviously depends entirely on the strength of your planeswalkers and the number of them. Uh, I, I'm not playing this with one or two planeswalkers in my deck unless they are super bombs, like they're a Gideon and a Liliana. Because you got to remember, you might just draw them before you draw this, and then this card's dead. So yeah, my instinct is that this is still pretty bad. Tutors just never really get there in limited. Uh, obviously has a floor of an F in case you have no planeswalkers at all. But even if you have a couple of the uncommon ones, I still don't think I'm playing this. Uh, as we'll see today and further on, there are uncommon planeswalkers kicking around. And not all of them are good. Like, I think most of them are playable. But there's some where I just would pretty readily see myself cutting them and some that I absolutely don't want to play. So I, I would be careful about going into this format thinking that everyone is always going to have planeswalkers and there's always going to be some on the battlefield and you're always going to have some that you want to draw because I think the average deck is actually going to have about two-ish planeswalkers. Yes, every pack has a planeswalker, which means that everybody gets to see three, but some planeswalkers are going to be taken for value. Gideon, Liliana, they're probably going to be worth a pretty penny. Even if you're not playing white-black, you might take them pack three, for example. Some of the walkers, as I said, aren't really that good, or they're very conditional, or they fit only into very specific archetypes that you might not be in. So they might not, you know, get played. So I don't think that it would be wise to think that every deck's going to have three. I think the average is going to be closer to two. So keep that in mind. This card I don't really like. Um, I, I'm going to go with an F, and occasionally, maybe this is like a D, but F for Ignite the Beacon. Up next is Ironclad Crobod. Ironclad Crobod is three and a white for a creature beast at common. It's a two five, and that's all it is. It's not very good. Two fives for four are not what I want. Uh, it's going to block, I guess. It's not going to block early aggro because it doesn't come down till turn four at the earliest. Um, it's just, it's, it's no, it's no. There, there's no real deck for this in any format. I can't imagine there's going to be a deck for this in this format. No real interest in Ironclad Crovat. It, it goes into the pile of oh no, I need a 23rd card, you're a card, in the deck you go. So C minus, uh, probably actually more in the D range for Ironclad Crovod. Up next is Law Rune Enforcer. Law Rune Enforcer is a single white mana for a creature human soldier at common. It's a 1-2, pay one generic mana, tap it. Tap target creature with converted mana cost 2 or greater. Uh, this card's amazing. This card's absolutely fantastic. Tappers have been kind of weak lately. The last good one that I can think of, not counting Icy Manipulator, was from Shadows of Innistrad. Uh, basically, we've had tappers that only tap flyers, or you have to pay four mana for it, or it only taps creatures that have three power or less, or things like that. But this is tapping basically everything you're afraid of, except for the zombie armies that are being made by a mass, because of course they have zero cmc this is a strong pick you should play every single copy that you have and it could even be first pickable in weaker packs it's a strong 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 b b plus is probably a little bit too too high of a grade but it's a strong b this card's amazing if you've never played with a tapper don't sleep on this this card's amazing and uh, a very strong first pick in a lot of packs solid b play every single copy Loxodon Sergeant is up next. Loxodon Sergeant is three and a white for a creature elephant soldier at common. It's a 3-3 three, three with vigilance. When Loxodon Sergeant enters the battlefield, other creatures you control gain vigilance until end of turn. Not super excited by this. It's very filler level. Uh, I, I talk a lot in my set reviews about how I don't want to pay extra for vigilance. It's a fine ability and it's nice to have, but I never want to play any extra mana to get vigilance on something. This is a good example of having to pay that tax. This is a 3-3. Three, three. If it was a vanilla creature, it should cost three mana. I don't really want to pay that extra one mana to give my team vigilance for a single turn or for a creature that has vigilance itself. It's fine, and sometimes you're just going to need to play it as a creature, um, but generally you should be looking to cut this and play better cards. So C- minus for Loxodon Sergeant. Up next is Makeshift Battalion. Makeshift Battalion is two and a white for a creature human soldier at common. Whenever Makeshift Battalion and at least two other creatures attack, this mechanic is called Battalion from Gatecrash, put a plus one plus one counter on Makeshift Battalion. This is fine. It's like a C, maybe a C plus. Uh, until you start attacking with this and making it bigger, it's just a vanilla 3-2 for three, which is fine. It's a C. You'll, you'll play it if you have to. Then if you're happily attacking with the team, 
I have to assume that you're winning. You know, you're, you're not throwing two things away to attack with this just to get to a single counter on it. So if you're already attacking with three creatures or more, you're, you're just winning. So this is just win more. Uh, I don't think I'm going to go up to a C plus here. Maybe, maybe it's like a really, really, really weak C plus. Um, yeah, I've talked myself into it. Let's go for a weak C plus. But again, it's a little bit win more. Martyr for the Cause is up next. Martyr for the Cause is one and a white for a creature human soldier at common. When Martyr for the Cause dies, proliferate. And it's a 2-2. It's not awful. It's a 2-2 for 2 with an upside, but the upside doesn't feel that great. Proliferate that you can't really control when it happens isn't really that great. You want to make sure that you know when proliferate is going to happen. Uh, and until then, you just have a 2-2 for 2, which unfortunately these days isn't terribly great uh, a 2-2 two, two for 2 with no rules text was a C forever but cards have gotten better the past uh, 5, 6, 7, 8 years here and so this is actually going to drop down to a C- minus. I would prefer generally not to play this up next is Parhelion 2. Parhelion 2 is 6 white white for a legendary artifact vehicle at rare. It's a 5-5. Five five. It has flying, first strike, and vigilance. And whenever Parhelion 2 attacks, create two 4-4 four four white angel creature tokens with flying and vigilance that are attacking. The crew cost is 4, meaning that you need to tap four power worth of creatures or more in order to make this a creature until then it's just an artifact that doesn't have power toughness can't attack etc on the battlefield this thing is basically unbeatable i don't know if you're getting it to the battlefield eight is an exceptionally tall ask in basically every format ever eight mana is just something really 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 hard to get to Think about Endre's Forerunners from Ravnica Allegiance. They were great, but they were really hard to cast, and this is going to be the same thing in a color combination that isn't really known for ramping. And not only do you have to cast this, you also have to have four power of creatures on the battlefield, or else it's just a useless rock. Now, swing once with this, and you probably win. You're dealing 13 damage in that single attack, and if you don't win, the angels stick around. This isn't Geist of St. Traft. They don't go away after the attack, which means next turn you're attacking with even more. Plus, those angels have vigilance they didn't tap. You can block with them. So, like I said, this card seems insane on the battlefield. I foresee a lot of people dying with this in their hand, though, and eight lands not on the battlefield. In sealed, I'd play this just because it's a slower format always, and you're a little bit more likely to get to eight, especially in the pre-release. This is just going to be some free wins if people are, you know, doing weird stuff, testing stuff out, playing cards that maybe aren't that good, they didn't evaluate them properly. But once draft comes along, I think I steer clear of this. It's just so expensive. But man, if you can get this on the battlefield, you should just win. So this is a hard grade. This is like a D plus, except when it's an A plus. Up next is Pouncing Lynx. Pouncing Lynx is one and a white for a creature cat at common. It's a two one. As long as it's your turn, Pouncing Lynx has first strike. So we saw this in uh, uh, Boros in Guilds of Ravnica as fresh faced recruit, and it was always solid if you were in aggro and Pouncing Links is going to be exactly the same. It's a solid C. It pushes up towards a C plus. Um, if you're not in aggro, you probably don't really want to play this. But if you are, it's going to be totally OK. So C to C plus for Pouncing Links. Prison Realm is up next. Prison Realm is two and a white for an enchantment at Uncommon. When Prison Realm enters the battlefield, exile target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls until Prison Realm leaves the battlefield. When Prison Realm enters the battlefield, scry one. Uh, it's the O-ring of the set, and as always, it's very, very good. Scrying one is a nice little bonus. You're not paying any extra for it. It's a snap first pick in most packs. It's very strong. Give me every single copy of this that I can get my hands on. Uh, A- minus just because it can be removed and they get the creature back, but A- minus for Prison Realm, strong first pick, great removal. Up next is Rally of Wings. Rally of Wings is one and a white for an instant at uncommon. Untap all creatures you control. Creatures you control with flying get plus two, plus two until end of turn. The surprise untap is cute, but only plus two, plus two to flyers is not something that I'm a huge fan of. That's a little bit narrow. Uh, as a trumpet blast effect on attacks to help finish, it could be nice. 
All in all, this is pretty deck dependent, I think, and arguably feels win more. If you have a bunch of flyers that you're happily attacking with, that game's going to be over anyways. This card's probably not worth it. You could just play another flyer for uh, uh, resiliency. Play another creature, play removal, play something else that's less win more than this. I think this card just reads a little bit better than it is, and I'm not super excited to be playing it. So I'm at a D plus on Rally of the Flight. It's going to get me once or twice, but I don't think it's very good. Ravnica at War is up next. Ravnica at War is three and a white for a sorcery at rare. Exile all multicolored permanents. So this is not a Ravnica set. This is not a guilds set. There's a lot of multicolored in here. There is more multicolored than normal, but there are 30 or so less multicolored cards than were in Ravnica Allegiance or Guilds of Ravnica. So you just can't guarantee that you're going to be getting much value out of this. So I think it's purely a sideboard card. You see a scary multicolored permanent in game one, Side this in, it says three and a white, kill that card you're afraid of. Now it is symmetrical, so it could end up hurting you if you also have multicolored permanence. So as it is, I I'm gonna go like a D on this. I'm never main decking it, but maybe I bring it in out of the sideboard once or twice. Uh, but being a rare, I have a feeling you're not gonna be able to actually draft this that often um, to put in the sideboard. So D for Ravnica at war. Rising Populous is up next. Rising Populous is two and a white for a creature human at common. It's a 2-2. Two -two. Whenever another creature or planeswalker you control dies, put a plus one plus one counter on Rising Populous. Seems fine. Unruly Mob was okay, but starting as a 1-1 one -one means that it took a while to become relevant. Uh, being a 2-2, two -two, as Rising Populous is for three mana, means that this will become relevant faster. Still, it's not an amazing card, it's not a high pick or anything, and you may not even instantly play it in every deck. I think it's a solid C, but you do have to remember, if this thing's getting a bunch of counters, it means your creatures are dying left and right, which probably means you're not having a good time or doing terribly well in that game. So, C for Rising Populous. We've seen this effect before and it's not great, but I think this is a slightly better version. Single Combat is up next. Single Combat is three white-white for a sorcery at rare. Each player chooses a creature or planeswalker they control, then sacrifices the rest. Players can't cast creatures or planeswalker spells until the end of your next turn. This card is awful. Like, really awful. It'll get you out from behind, of course, but if you're even close to parity on the board with your opponent, you're just going to be in the same situation with less creatures your opponent still gets to have their best creature because they pick and you get to have your best creature and you don't even get to start rebuilding your board for two turns and your opponent gets the first crack at playing a creature after this wrath super no super no this is not a wrath that i'm excited for um and, and I, I don't think you should ever play it i've got this at an f i, I think it's just really 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 bad giving your opponent the choice of the creature not being the first to get to rebuild after this wrath because you can't play a creature that turn or your next turn no interest f for single combat up next is sunblade angel sunblade angel is five and a white for a creature angel at uncommon she's a three three with flying first strike vigilance and lifelink just everything um six mana is a little bit rough but if this isn't removed, you just win the game. It's like a strong B, I think, but it also just will not be correct to put this in some very low curve decks. You know, if you're a red white aggro and you're topping out at three mana, maybe four, you might not have a spot for this. Um, but I think a lot of decks will be very, very happy with this. I think it's a strong ish pick, six mana. It's a little bit much for white, but this card's really, really good. So I've got Sunblade Angel at a B. I think it's very solid. Just remember, there's going to be the occasional times where you probably should cut it. Up next is our first Uncommon Walker. Uncommon Walkers in this set have a static ability, just like everybody, and have just a minus ability. Up first is Teo the Shield Mage. Teo the Shield Mage is two and a white for a legendary planeswalker, Teo, at Uncommon. This is a new planeswalker from the War of the Spark novel. Uh, they start with five loyalty. You have Hexproof is the static ability. And for minus two, you can create an O3 white wall creature token with Defender. This is what I talked about when I said that not all of the walkers are really all that good. Having Hexproof is not exciting and limited. 
it's relatively rare that that ever comes up. You're just not targeted very often. And getting to make a pair of 3-3 walls before Teo is then at 1 and can't minus 2 anymore is also not really exciting. An 0-3 is not much of a wall. I think this is a possible sideboard option if you, uh, you know, could really use those 0-3 walls to live just a little bit longer, but... As it is, I don't think I actually main deck Teo. I don't think he's good enough. So D plus for Teo might be okay out of the sideboard, but I don't think I'm actually playing Teo just uh, by default here. Teo's signature spell is Teo's Light Shield. Teo's Light Shield is two and a white for a creature illusion at common. It's an O3. When Teo's Light Shield enters the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. This doesn't do anything for me either. Uh, an 03 for 3 is really, really, really expensive. I, I don't like playing them for 1 mana. Getting 1 counter on something? That's not worth it either. Uh, and I don't want this to be a 1-4. That's still not very good for 3 mana. And 1 counter just isn't worth a card. So I'm not playing Teo's Light Shield. I think it's real mediocre. I've got it at D minus. Of course, maybe you desperately need a creature in here, I guess. But no, this is a D minus. It's not a good card. Up next is Tomic, Distinguished Advocist. Tomic is white white for a legendary creature human advisor at rare. There are two three with flying, lands on the battlefield, and land cards in graveyards can't be the targets of spells or abilities your opponents control. No, that's not really relevant in this format. Your opponents can't play land cards from graveyards. No, that's not really relevant in this format. This is a two three flyer for two. That's it. And that's fine. 2-3 flyer for 2 is great. We'll see a number of 2-3 flyers for 3 or even 4 in this format. And uh, two for 2 mana is great. But this is not super impactful. Like, this is not a rare that I'm happy to see your first picking. But, you know, if I see this kind of 3rd, 4th, 5th pick, I'll probably pick it up. Um, obviously not splashable because it's not impactful, but it's also double white. Uh, but you'll play this and it's fine. It's a fine C+, but it's not in any way exciting. It's, it's a rare that you're going to feel bad opening. Up next is Topple the Statue. Topple the Statue is two and a white for an instant at common. Tap target permanent. If it's an artifact, destroy it. Draw a card. Not really interested in this. Pressure point was never playable, which was this minus the artifact stuff. Um, and destroying the artifact is not really that exciting either. Uh, as we'll see when we get to the artifacts, there's not that many in the set. And beyond the rare colored ones, like Parhelion 2, they're not really that good. Uh, keep this in the sideboard for those rare colored artifacts that are good and happily sided in, and it's gonna feel pretty good there. But otherwise, don't really play this. Uh, this is just a D, D for topple the statue. Up next is Trusted Pegasus. Trusted Pegasus is two and a white for a creature Pegasus. It's a two, two, flyer. Whenever Trusted Pegasus attacks, target attacking creature without flying gains flying until end of turn. It's Pegasus Courser, it's Rock Charger, except it's common again. And it's a 2-2 instead of a 1-3. This is... this is weird? Like, this is really good. Pegasus Courser was a common back in, I think, Dominaria. And then when M19 came around, they went, oh, this is actually too good. We need to make this an uncommon. And now it's back to common and it has more power, which means it can't block quite as well. It's not a 1-3, but it attacks better. It's a 2-2. Two -two. This card's super good and it should be a very high pick for you. Auto include every single copy in every white deck. This card is great. Um, I, I have this at a B minus. It maybe should just be a B. It's going to end games. Don't sleep on this. It's a fantastic card. Um, I'm going for it. B for Trusted Pegasus. It's wild that this is at common again after being moved up to uncommon. Up next is a new Planeswalker, the Wanderer. The Wanderer is three and a white for a legendary Planeswalker with no name. They're at uncommon. They start with five loyalty. Their static ability is prevent all non-combat damage that would be dealt to you and other permanents you control. Minus two, exile target creature with power four or greater. So the static ability, kind of like Teo, isn't super relevant. You don't take that much non-combat damage in limited generally. It's not like there's dedicated burn decks out there. So the static ability isn't terribly relevant, but it could have some very real sideboard implications. Exiling a creature with four or greater power could be okay, but I'm not super sold on this. We've of course seen this spell before. It was called Smite the Monstrous, and I remember it being called something else as well. I think Elspeth was on that card. Um, it's 
a fine ability, but it's typically way, 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 way better out of the sideboard. You know, looking at white, I think this hits one creature, and that's the Parhelion 2. Taking a look at green, just to spoil things a little bit, I only see like three or four things that this could hit. Over in the gold cards, taking a quick look, I see not many. So the Wanderer, much like Teo, I think I actually prefer in the sideboard. The static ability just doesn't do enough for me, but could out of the sideboard be relevant. And the minus ability is just dead a lot of the time. And so I think, I think this is only gonna come out of the sideboard for me. So I've got the Wanderer at a D plus as well. Up next is Wanderer's Strike with the Wanderer's signature spell. Wanderer's Strike is four and a white for a sorcery at common, exile target creature, then proliferate. This is great. The Wanderer is a sideboard card, but the Wanderer's Strike is super good. It is unconditional, flat out removal. It's sorcery speed. That sucks a little bit, but you hopefully get some counters assuming you've got some planeswalkers kicking around or plus ones or whatever. Solid removal ever so slightly below the A level because it is five mana sorcery speed. Instant speed's always better, but it's an easy B plus. This is gonna be a strong first pick in a lot of packs. And our final card for today is War Screecher. War Screecher is one and a white for a creature bird at common. It's a 1-3 flyer, and you can pay five and a white and tap it to give other creatures you control plus one, plus one until end of turn. This is a fine enough card. It can hold the skies a little bit, which is nice. Uh, maybe even hold the ground for a short while. Get in for little bits of damage here and there, and then it's a good mana sink in the late game. But of course, you do need to have a bunch of creatures that can attack to actually take advantage of this because this isn't taking advantage of it. I think it's totally okay. I think it's a high C, maybe a low C plus uh, in those very go wide decks that are thinking they're gonna get to this point of the game. It's like a C plus, but uh, you know, I'm not gonna go out of my way to play it, but I'll play it. So that's gonna wrap it up for White of War of the Spark. We're gonna be doing blue, black, red, green in the next few days, and then we will do the, uh, the gold and the artifact cards. Probably over two days, we'll split them in half because there are, I think, 70 or 80 uh, uh, multicolored plus artifact plus lands plus etc. I think it's like 60 or 70, actually. Uh, but yeah, we're going to be doing that over the rest of the week. So white looks uh, interesting. I definitely came away after having recorded this feeling like I was way more negative than I expected to be about white. There's a lot of bad cards. There, there's Charmed Stray and there's, you know, meaningless combat tricks and... You know, I'm not a huge fan of the two white on common planeswalkers. I think they could do very well out of the sideboard, but I'm not jumping to main decking them. Um, but there are some great cards in here. There's, of course, Oketra, who is just going to win games. There's Prison Realm, which is great removal, and Wanderer's Strike, and uh, there are some very, very good cards here in white. So let me know what you think of white, what cards you're excited by, what cards you think I was right with, wrong with. Talk with me, talk with each other down below. As always, if you uh, have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Twitch, all at The Mana Leak. You can find me at patreon.com slash Leak if you want to become a supporter there and help this channel keep going. If you go over to inkedgaming.com, you can use the promo code MANALEAK10, all one one word one zero is the number to get 10% off your order and help the channel out click that thumbs up up button if you want to help the channel out that way you could also click subscribe if you want to see more and if you do have questions comments or suggestions let me know otherwise i'll see you all tomorrow for the blue set review